just a so, <clears throat> rant over. <laughs> I think <laughs> maybe the power, the power platform rant podcast. <laughs> listen, like <laughs> exactly subscribe. Right. Oh, they should listen to us offline. <laughs> Way worse offline. <laughs> oh, someday. <laughs> we don't record half the rants. <laughs> they, they don't even know. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Power Platform Boost podcast, your timely source of Power Platform news and updates with your host, Ulrike Ackerbeck and Nick Dolman, myself. Hello, Ulrike. How are you? I'm good, Nick. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. We have, lo- we have a ton of exciting stuff uh, happening in the world of Power Platform. Oh, yeah. We could actually, I think this week will be Power Pages week. We could have filled an entire year episode just by Power Pages announcements, I think, this week. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff. and But again, we're not, uh, we're not refreshed the cash. Uh, <laughs> we're, all, we, we're, we, we like to give equal footing to all of the Power Platform. We're so. trying our best, but Power Pages <laughs> sneak in there <laughs> every week. But that's natural, you know, being one fifth of the platform and everything. I Absolutely. think it's only natural. Absolutely. But let's kick off this uh, episode with something not related to Power Pages. And I think this is the product that you, between you and me, this is the thing that we have least experience with. Am I right? The Power BI? Yeah, the, the yellow Pro- one. Yes, the the yellow. Oh, the yellow one. Yeah, what is that all about? <laughs> <laughs> And I think that goes for um, more than just us, because the the community around Power BI has been such a great community for so many years. Being included in the Power Platform doesn't change all that. And so I think this is is still kind of that feel within the community as well, that they're so established in their own. uh, And then it's all the other guys and all the other products uh, on the site. And and the Power BI folks are amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we do, of course, also read the Power BI uh, feature summary that comes out once a month. Uh, and if you don't subscribe to that, that's something you should uh, check out. Of course, we will have links to that in the show notes. Uh, and this week, something caught my eye. So dynamic format strings for measures. So it sounds kind of strange. But let me just walk you through what it is. So when you have a report, um, and you have a string and you have the ability to select what kind of format it is by a drop down at the top. So now you have a new option at the bottom called dynamic. So instead of selecting number or a string or, or a currency, you can say dynamic. And when you do that, you get a new a kind of editing experience where you have the ability to put in a formula uh, where you can have conditional formatting, for instance. So the example that they give is a dynamic currency indicator. So you would have um, a dollar and the you Norwegian know, kroners, and they would have different indicators or different uh, icons or whatever. And that is uh, the type of scenario they would use for this. So then this uh, string, this measure would be different based on another value in another string, for instance. So that is a really cool uh, new feature for Power BI that I wanted to highlight. And of course, there's loads more in the feature summary. But for me, being, you know, most into mostly into part pages in my daily work, we have huge announcements, everything. So it's big features coming out. I see this product has been around for a while because the announcements are for very specific details. To me, an outsider would say it's, it's very detailed, it's very in small pieces, very important pieces, but I, it's a very big difference in the kind of features that get released. They're in the details, they're in the, uh, the, the things that you see that this is a requirement. Someone has asked for this and they're finally getting it. So um, if you're into Power BI, check out the April feature summary and um, yeah, a lot of good meat bits in there. What what I like about how Power BI the Power BI team does their releases is they have like a monthly summary of the releases, very much like Visual Studio Code does. If you use VS Code, you know once a month, and it's probably today's May first, so probably when I open it later to get into my work, I'm going to see all the the new features. Or I think it's on a specific day, the Center of Excellence, the same thing. 
where you can almost set your calendar to know this is the day the new features are going to come out so we can check that out. So I like how some of those teams do that. And um, I like to think that other teams could eventually adopt that as well. So we're not just, you know, all of a sudden on a Friday afternoon, given a big announcement like there was last Friday afternoon. Um, how's that for a nice segue, right? Oh, yeah, that's a world class segue. <laughs> So do you mean Power Pages announcements? At a Power Pages announcements. Now, I guess as much as we say we're, we, you know, we want to focus on the entire Power Platform, um, I think it's no secret. I have a little bit of an inside track of what's coming out. So I knew that this particular feature was rolling out and was working on the documentation last week to get it ready for public preview. And it's huge. It's, it's solution management in Power Pages. What does that mean? That means that you can take your sites and your site components. You could add those to a Power Platform solution, export that solution, move it over, import it into a new environment. And that's one way, that will be the way to transport your site components from one environment to another, along with all the rest of your Dataverse forms, views, and everything else you're building out your entire solution, entire application. And this is, this has been something I know has been being worked on for quite a long time. And now it's finally rolling out in public preview, um, meaning, you know, evaluate it. Don't quite go to production yet with it. Although, you know, like I know people do that anyway, um, but you can, you can check it out. Now, a couple little things that are um, tied to, to that. And the one, the big thing is it is tied to something called the enhanced data model. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The other thing is, on your destination, well, currently for public preview, you'll need to enable the enhanced data model in order to use solutions. Um, that's, the, that's the key thing. You need to make sure that's gonna happen. And then there's only certain templates that you can use with solutions right now. The starter templates one to five, um, I believe it was either building permit or the after school or the one of those three, I guess you could call solution starter templates um, not all of them. Of course, the blank template, the Dynamics 365 templates will come later. At this point, they're not going to be enabled for, for data models. So if you're using customer self-service, you're still going to have to go through the old way or the legacy way, as like we like to say, in terms of moving the site metadata. And there's and those tools exist. They work really well. There's the XRM Toolbox Portal Record Mover, which I've used for years and absolutely love uh, uh, Tangai Tazar. Uh, shout out to Tangai. Um, of course, XRM Toolbox, um, he built that tool and it's great for moving uh, portal configuration. And of course, configuration migration tool, as well as doing it with the Power Platform command line interface. Those things will continue to work. And even if you're, if that's how you even want to do it, um, there are new parameters for the new and en new enhanced data model and also some uh, commands for solutions as well. Uh, to help you out with that. And then the other big thing is you need to actually provision a um, Power Pages site on your destination environment. It needs to actually go through that process to create the, I guess, the host in Azure. So effectively, you'll create a site on your destination. And then with the solutions, you'll move over the solutions and then you'll just rewire it up. You'll basically go into the uh, site admin and flip it, flip to the solution that you brought through the, sorry, the website that you brought in with the solution. And then away you go. It's all brought over easy peasy. And of course you can add that to pipelines. And this is really going to help accelerate the ALM processes. So uh, Does very the cool. portals have to be the same type, the same template? Because you could move, move portals before you would have to make sure that it was the template three in both the, the host and the, or the, the test and the dev. That's a great question. No, it doesn't have to be. So for instance, like I created a portal using a portal website. I'm going to call it portals forever. Um, <laughs> it's uh, I created a website using starter template one. And then in my destination environment, all I spun up was the blank template because it's not using those solutions and parameters, the metadata. It's really about that host and that host is the same. That's the, basically that Azure dot or sorry, that dot net web application that gets created in Azure. That's what we're really looking for. So it really doesn't matter what portal or website template you create on the destination environment, as long as it's the enhanced data model as well. 
So yeah, so b- both need to be the enhanced data model, and then you could actually delete the 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 portal you spun up on yeah. the test environment. You, you can delete that afterwards after you switch. Yes, you can delete the met the yeah. the metadata within what's now called the Power Pages management app, which you'll yeah. have you'll notice it looks exactly the same as the portal management app. So that's not going anywhere. The, you'll just notice that in the upper left hand corner it says Power Pages management app. And so a question kind of comes up, what's the difference between the two? Well, from the front side, it looks like no difference. They operate the exact same. On the back end though, this is where I'm going to get into the next news item about the enhanced data model, which was is part of the solution announcement, but of course didn't get the same amount of fanfare. And I, I see in LinkedIn, it kind of raised a few questions about what is this enhanced data model and why do we need it? It's, it's one of these things from an end user point of view, really, they know they don't see any difference whatsoever. Um, <laughs> very much like for me at home, I have some foundation issues I have to fix on my house. And it's going to be a bit of a process to go through this, but there's no visibility. You don't really see any changes, but it's something that absolutely has to be done. This is a kind of a similar situation. You don't have to do it, but this is the way things will be moving forward. And the benefit is if you've worked with Power Apps portals in the past, you've seen that there's 60 plus tables and a whole bunch of different solutions. Um, and they're all ADX underscore because of course portals came originally from ADX studio. This actually replaces this with three tables, which are going to be part of core dataverse, meaning that go, uh, there's going to be a point in the future where every single dataverse that you, that you provision, and we're not even talking power pages yet, dataverse will have those tables sitting there ready for when, if you decide to implement power pages. So all of that data that normally was stored across those 60 tables has now been converted to a JSON format, which is stored in the site components table. Now, again, a lot of people are going to be raising the question, do I need to learn JSON? Do I have to figure this out? This sounds complicated. Not at all. You don't even need to look at it because this actually will get trans, basically um, transcribed, transferred, or visible through virtual tables. So all of these tables that are used to still technically, well, they've actually been renamed their MPP underscore, but they're all virtual tables. So that's why when you open up the Power Pages management app, that model-driven app looks and acts the same, but it's actually talking to those virtual tables. So if you go in and you want to create a content snippet, or even if you want to create web pages going through that, the portal management app instead of the design studio, basically the exact same way you create those records and they'll just in the back end, create those as JSON strings, adding that to the table. So um, so that's where, because of that infrastructure, it's going to help adding to solutions. Now, the other big benefit to this is when you provision a website, this can take, um, the fastest I've seen it ever done currently is like 17, 18 minutes, but most of the time it's, 45 minutes to an hour, and even sometimes it can go beyond that depending on how busy the system is. And that's a real pain for anybody trying Power Pages, for doing any kind of training classes, um, even kind of demos and things like that. It just takes a while to spin up a website. The new data model, it's literally now two to three minutes tops, and you have a site up and ready to go. And the team is still working to make that even faster, like some folks feel it should be almost instantaneous or just as quick as creating any other asset. So I think it should actually take a couple of minutes because then you feel (laughs) like you're getting something heavy, something complex. If it takes, if it's instantly, then it's like, what is this? Yeah, fair enough. Okay. But can you still download the portal to your local machine and work with with your studio code like we've been doing for the last year? Is that still a thing or do you have to then battle with the JSON files? No, 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 no. You don't need, again, if you're a de- developer and I'm, um, or you don't know if you're not a developer, but if you're still used and comfortable working with that Power Pages meta website metadata, the PAX CLI and downloading it to Visual Studio Code for the desktop is still very much a thing. And those commands, there are actually new um, parameters that you would pass to specify the data model of which you're downloading and uploading that data. 
So it's just a couple extra parameters. So you can switch by default, it's still going to be standard, but you actually can specify that you want to, you'll download this and the enhanced data model. And then you can just work it in VS code, the same as you would go do your updates, add your liquid code, add your JavaScript, add your CSS, do all your magic, and then just run those commands and upload it back into your dev site. It works exactly the same. So really there's no big change in the way you do work. The big change would be if you're using PAX CLI to move your portal data from one environment to another, you still can continue to do that if you wish. However, now there's a better way using solutions where you can package everything up in one solution and move it over. Yeah, nice. I'm really looking forward to, to playing with this. And uh, actually, this is what I'm going to talk about at the Microsoft Power Platform Conference in Vegas in October. This is one of my sessions. It's Power Pages ALM. And I just bet it on, the, on this being released because we knew that this was coming on the MVP side. And I just had a bet that by October, this would be released so that I can talk about it. Or else I would have to show the old way, of course, which is not that bad. But I mean, this is something I'm really, really excited about. Yeah. Oh, me too. It's, it, uh, yeah, definitely something I've been, I've been itching to tell, to, to tell people about for a while. And, and then finally, yeah, when the, when the team told me about it last week, so yeah, we're, we're, we're flipping the switch and I'm like, okay, are you sure? Like, and then yeah, Friday morning, it was time to publish the docs. And I said, okay, are we still good to go? And I got the thumbs up from our, our one uh, program manager, Katanjali, who's, one of these amazing people that I work with that just so brilliant and all the cool stuff that they come up with. It's so good. Nice. Really cool. Another cool thing that I saw in the community this week, just to, you know, I'm not good at that segues like you just to move uh, things along here. Um, I saw, and this is actually a, a friend of mine, Ru Rui Santos. He works for the, for the Paracat team today. Uh, he created a custom web API that will allow you to create QR codes with Canvas apps. And I really think this is cool because I've used this a lot and then I have to rely on a third party connector. I think it's Encodian or something that has a trial for me to use 30 day trial. But this actually relieves me of that uh, third party and it uh, allows me to create those QR codes with this custom web API. So if anyone out there is using the same thing as I am and want to create QR codes on the go, then yeah, please uh, look into that. So links in the show notes. Um, and another cool thing that I saw by someone that we also also mentioned a lot on this podcast is Matthew Devaney. He, um, this is one of those things that we talked about last time as well. It, it is a new feature in Canvas app that allows you to print uh, Power Apps pages, and there's um, some uh, there's a, a flipping of a switch in the settings somewhere to enable the Power Apps PDF function. It's an experimental feature, and then you add a button or a, a, an icon or something to your screen, and you uh, trigger that PDF function and send some parameters about which screen to print, what um, values for size and orientation, margins and resolution. And then it will print that page as a PDF for you. And it's kind of a laugh in the community as well, because come on, printing Power Apps pages, when would you ever need to? But then reality is, it, it, this is one of the most the high, most highly rated requests that Microsoft has gotten through ideas. The, the ability to print to PDF uh, Power Pages site, or sorry, Power Apps pages. <laughs> wow, that's a mind bump. <laughs> mind bump. <laughs> well, you know, Microsoft, they okay. like to, to keep things yeah, confusing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the Power Apps pages designer. Ah, oh, that threw yeah. me for a loop as well. <laughs> it's, it's Power Apps, wait for it, pages design. Yeah. Exactly. Is that a Power Apps or a Power Pages <laughs> thing? <laughs> Turns out it's a power Just, apps thing. <laughs> All right, moving on. That, that's that's <laughs> why you on the topic. <laughs> Listen to my segue on the topic of <laughs> power apps pages designer. <laughs> Nick, you have some news about updates for forms and list as well. Absolutely, yes. For and this is in model driven apps, so this has nothing to do at all with power pages. Although you can use, of course, forms and views in power pages use model driven forms and views. But it is Power Apps. It is. This is Power Apps, 100%. Power, pure Power Apps. So what's cool is, is the ability to, 
update your forms and views more conveniently with the table designer. So if you're in your solutions and power apps, you're building a model driven app. Here's the way we used to do it in the old days, the old days, meaning last week, we would add a field and then, oh shoot, I have to add it to a form. So I'd go into my form or forms, uh, and then add the, add the field there. Okay, cool. Publish. And then, oh shoot, I forgot to add it to views. And then I would have to go into the view designer and add it to all the views that I want to add it to. And there's, you know, there's other tools like the view layout replicator next from toolbox that helps you, you know, make copies of your views that helps streamline that a little bit, but it's still, you're doing a lot of clicking and navigating. Um, and of course, sometimes you get that spinny and then it's sort of your notifications pop up or your phone buzzes. And then you go back, okay, what was I working on again? This is a little thing, but it's really cool is when you add that field, you have this option to update your forms and views. And it just kind of, there's a little button there. As soon as you add a field, there's a little red dot and you click on that. And then you can say, oh, I've added this new field. I also want to add it and you can list your forms and then you can add your list, your views, you click okay. And then boom, it's done. You still can go in and probably adjust your forms and views a little bit, but at least yeah. that field is there. And it's already in most cases, that's probably your 90% of the way there. And you can move on and keep adding fields and, and working on your solution. So to me, that was a, like I said, it may seem like a little thing, but I think it's going to be a huge time saver over time and really excited about that. And yeah, but do you know the dark side of that little feature yeah. is very time consuming as well, because that is what I did this week. So I enabled it and I was so happy. Yeah, sure. Bring that along. What happened? I discovered, oh, no, shoot. Oh, I need to delete the whole thing. I need to delete this. <laughs> and that is time consuming. So where are your XRM toolbox tool for delete this? And remove it from all, first because it has dependencies. First, remove all the data, then remove the the column from all the forms and all the lists that you added it to. And if it's a related, if it's a relation to another table as well, you need to go into every single one and remove all those dependencies before you can remove it. That's what I did this week. <clears throat> that, that's funny because I knew exactly where you were going because I did the same thing. <laughs> I was like, I added a column, <laughs> but I'm like, oh, what what is this? Oh, wow. And then it's like, oh, shoot, I don't want this column anymore. Oh, or, and like, okay, I'll just delete it. And like, oh, oh, no, no, no. Then you get the little finger wagging coming from Power Apps. No, no, you can't delete it. It's being used somewhere. Like, uh, yeah. And I wish that when they release new functionality like this, they would also release the reversible one so that you can actually remove everything. The same goes with Power Pages as well. You, I mean, you can create your own website. No, no, And then they create, you know, the ALM, you can move your website. But if you try to remove a Power Pages website, you know there's still things lingering that you need to delete manually. So sure, give us a lot of tools that create a lot of great content, but then please also give us the tools to reverse it. Please. Just a so, <clears throat> rant over. <laughs> I think <laughs> maybe the power, the power platform rant podcast. <laughs> listen, <laughs> yeah, like exactly subscribe. Right. Oh, they should listen to us offline. <laughs> Way worse offline. <laughs> oh, someday. <laughs> we don't record half the rants. <laughs> they don't even know. <laughs> oh, this is cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, and on, on the topic of forms and views and columns and tables, one thing that I would love more than anything these days because I'm data modeling is a way to actually see the data model that you create in Dataverse as a as a visual, right? The mm -hmm. way you have, but you, can see, you can do this with Power BI, you've been able to do it for a while. And now you can uh, enable data model settings to allow you to edit your data model, model in Power BI service. It's a preview feature. And it will create a button in the toolbar called open data model for you. And when you click that button, it will open the data model that you're modeling underneath and it will allow you to edit your data model in this visual view. Hallelujah. Can Ooh. we get this straight into Dataverse, please? Please. Wow. Yeah, because that's been in S SQL for a thousand years already. That's really cool. Okay, I got to try that. <sighs> I'm, I'm I all know, about that's what we do in Visio anyways, right? Cause this is, it, it's like the document my flow 
uh, or possibility that we have now. It's okay, done. It's hours and hours of work, done. With this feature, we would not have to do the VCO anymore. We would not have to do the documentation, do this manually anymore. We could export this as a as a, um, as a visual. Mm -hmm. And it will be, yeah, documenting the data as you go. And it will be live, always updated. Perfect. Cool. So will that create like tables and columns and stuff as well? Or just your the linking of the data model? Do you know? I'm not sure because I'm not a Power BI person, so I haven't tried it out. <laughs> but to me, it's the holy grail. Please, something like that in Dataverse. And if you know, please shout out and teach us in the on all social media. Please, we will love someone from the Power BI community to grab hold of Power Platform Boost podcast on social media and telling us what this actually means. Cool. And even if you do a TikTok and video, we'll even watch that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have TikTok, so no. Nick will watch it. Sure. And then on the topic of virtual tape, sorry, on tables, there's other news par pages related, right? Yeah. So this is an interesting one. This has actually been out for a week or two already, and it hasn't gotten a lot of uh, fanfare yet, but is the ability to use virtual tables in Power Pages. Now, this has been something that has always kind of been a question, and you could get it sort of working, but there was always issues with caching, with linking some of the, the data types. So it was, if you got it working, it was always very clunky and it was a little bit like a house of cards. Of course, with the Dynamics 365 finance and operations um, virtual tables, those were available. There was actually one of the um, Dynamics 365 portal templates that use those virtual tables. That's been out for a while, but this, Number one question I get, or not number one question, um, one of the big questions I get, I'm sure you get this too, Ulrika, is... Number five-ish. Yeah. It's sort of like, hey, I have an SQL database. Can I, I want to build a Power Pages site. Can I connect to my SQL database or SQL, depending on who you are, how you pronounce it. And it's before it's like, mm, not really, you know, but now you can set up a virtual table in SQL or sorry, set up a virtual table in Dataverse pointing to either SQL or SharePoint, although SharePoint's not a database. Um, <laughs> even that's don't a whole, get us started. Don't get us started nope. on that. Don't go there. Continue. But if you, if you do have a list in SharePoint that you want to display on a Power Pages site, that is also very doable with the, this virtual table provider. And it's all following a wizard. It's all very automatic. Now, I know that wizard has been out now wow. for since January, just for regular model driven apps and for Canvas apps to do that link. There's a couple of good videos out there. I know April Dunham's done a video, uh, Lisa Crosby's done a video as well on how to set that up. And of course the documentation is there. And, but now you can surface these virtual tables within your Power Pages site. Now, the one thing that you have to be aware of is you can do relationships to other Dataverse tables. So for instance, link it to either an account table or your contact table. And what's important about that is then you can assign web roles the same as you do any other table. So if you have an SQL table that has a whole list of data, but it's only available to certain you know, members of your community or your customers, if you can do that relationship to an account or contact, then when they log into their website, they'll only see the data that they're allowed to see based on the web role and the table permissions. So all that still applies, except now that it's through a virtual table. So very, very cool. We have documentation on that. And I actually will be releasing yeah. a video probably later this week um, on how to set that up and, and how to run through that. So definitely check that out. And um, yeah, another one of these great little features that popped up and um, the next one is, um, oh, just, I'm, just, just, whoop. I want to mention, so this comes, full, this makes power pages full circle for me. Cause I started as a SharePoint consultant. And when I started, we had the online SharePoint sites and people use that to build websites. So my mm -hmm. first job actually as a consultant was to build an official on a public website using Share, SharePoint as the data source <laughs> and, you know, having those a public web. And now I work with a product that has the ability to push SharePoint sites or lists as a data source to public websites. I mean, I'm done. It's full circle. There, there you go. Kind of thing. Yeah. 10 years later. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> and this so, is what you talked about earlier too, right? So without these virtual tables, we wouldn't be able to have the enhanced data model. We wouldn't have the solution management, the ailing capabilities. This is all tied together, isn't it? The uh, uh, Actually, it isn't. The virtual tables, you can run on a standard data model as well. You don't need the enhanced data model for this. This is just strictly surfacing dataverse uh, information. But of course, with these, you know, those settings um, and those connections and things, of course, you add those to a solution. And I think you can move that over. I wonder how that works. But it is yeah. something that... But it's um, the other way around as well, because the JSON files, they oh, will yes. they utilize the virtual tables, right? So without the virtual tables, and I mean, I should have, I wanted to see this have more of a fanfare than it is, because this is also talking to one of the strengths to the Power Platform. We rarely do integration work with Power Platform because it is keep your data where your data is. If it's stored securely and, and uh, in a robust way, don't move it. That's not, that's not what we do. We connect to your data where your data is. Virtual tables allow you to do that with Power Pages as well. Having your main data source as Dataverse where it's what is still the preferable data mm. source, right? And you can bring in additional, or you can you can use virtual tables altogether. I think this is this is huge. I think all I get excited about everything, but I really get excited about this. I think this is much more important than the attention that it's getting. Um, as a, maybe people don't really realize or use it right yet. Maybe that's it. Um, I think I think it might get a bit more traction. Of course, a lot of these other features coming out, it might have kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit. And of course, with um, yeah, you know, with build coming up as well, there's probably some more more announcements coming um, along yeah. with everything else. When is build, by the way? We haven't the, talked a lot about build. We mentioned it last uh, episode. It's the the week of the five or six, uh, the half, the all the other oh, conferences. Oh yeah, that's the one with at the same time. Okay, good. I'm right. Yeah, we're all caught up. Maybe. Cool. And now that yeah, you're caught up, caught up, everyone else is caught up too. That's all good. So yeah, we, we have a couple works. other things to talk about. Um, you want to talk about improved variables and collections experience. Yeah. So I have a bad memory. So this is help for me. So, you know, variables and, and collections when you're creating Canvas apps, those are, yes, you can see them, but you need to go into the setting space to see mm -hmm. them and to, to view what variables and collections that you created. Now they're bringing that experience into the designer as well. So you don't have to remember, you can bring that in. So as you're writing your functions, you can bring that in or expressions. I get confused, but as you're typing, you can have that panel open and see your variables in your collections at the same time. Ooh. And that is really, yes. So that's amazing for someone with a bad memory like me. Um, and then we have something uh, not related to this at all, custom or Dataverse related. Yeah, the um, so this is where we get into the, the, the pure dev stuff and be able to create custom connectors for your web API within Visual Studio. Now, I haven't done a lot of really deep plugin development or custom uh, connection uh, development in quite a while. So this probably is, is something that I probably would find helpful if I do need to actually find, if I find myself in a position to do this. And this is the ability to create those custom connectors directly within uh, Visual Studio. And we're not talking Visual Studio code, we're talking full on, full blown, the Visual Studio code editor. And overall, I remember over the years, um, dynamic CRM and, and Power Platform, those types of connections into Visual Studio were always kind of lagging behind. You needed an older version of Visual Studio to use some of those tools and it was very specialized. And now this is, you know, again, we're beginning seeing more and more of that whole fusion dev story happening. And this is, it was pretty neat to go. I kind of walked through the blog and look through that. I haven't tried it myself, but the ability to do this, um, to build your custom connector directly within Visual Studio. And then once that's created, then you can go into Power Apps and your Canvas app and you'll be able to pick those connectors kind of right off the menu. And then away you go and you build out your app using those custom connectors. So definitely a huge time saver for anybody uh, doing development in the Power Platform. Nice, cool. I didn't understand a word, but it sounded cool. <laughs> All right, nice. So this is just a news segment, really. So we're half hour in and we're already, so already, <laughs> we're just through the news. So a lot of stuff, 
happened the last couple of weeks and we know that the next couple of weeks will be equally stuffed with news and, and announcements and i just want to mention one more thing as well i said if we have time but i feel it's really um important to mention nick no nick that's you that's me <laughs> neil benson yeah the the aussie version of nick no no, no, he's, no. I think he's That's originally funny. he's originally Irish, and then he's all over the world. But a big shout out to Neil. He's a good friend of the the show, good yeah. friend of ours. Absolutely, uh, and amazing with. Um, so he talks about um, agile, the agile approach, and Dynamics three sixty five and business applications uh, in the agile space. So he's very much about Scrum and how to build and how to. Um, structure your team to be more most efficient and to work best with these uh, platforms. And he has a podcast called Amazing Applications Podcast. Big shout out. We listen to the, the, the his podcast every week. And this last episode, he doesn't have a guest on. He's, it's just Neil talking. And he introduces a, a thing that I really, really resonated with me. It's called empiricism. I think I got that right. I practiced empiricism. And he says that it's, it's for teams that are building complex enterprise Dynamics 365 or platform applications um, in an exploratory way. So instead of writing up a lot of requirements and needs up front and then designing this in your head to the best of your abilities and knowledge at the time, you would instead open up our Canvas app or or model driven app for that matter, and start building with the, the components that you see and the features that you know, and to experiment and try to build the best solutions that you can as an experiment, as a proof of concept. And that is the way that I've been working for the last couple of years. I've rarely been set to write um, a solution document or anything. It's mostly, can you just build this to the best of your ability, use, take a couple of days and see what, how far you get with what's out of the box and a little customization and then show it to us, demo it to us. And, and then the customer will decide if it's, if it's a way to move forward and then you move forward to the MVP. So then you build out more uh, functionality, more, more pages, better, you know, you build out the data model and then you kind of go iteratively, iterally, iterally, iteratively, iteratively. <laughs> amazing okay sorry people you know what we mean <laughs> didn't rehearse that part <laughs> it's yeah, all right it's, it's so iterative. it cycles yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh and you and you kind of so it's um doing experiments observe observing what you get and then learning from that observation and then doing another experiment that is empiricism and in Neil Benson's latest podcast, he talks about this from the ground up. He talks about why, what it is and why it's important for Scrum. And he goes all the way to examples and real life scenarios where this is important and this is the way to move forward. And in, in, in my own experience as well, I do this with a customer today. They have a hu huge application that we, we're uh, replacing with the Power Platform, moving it to Power Platform, huge manual uh, scheduling work that we actually have transformed into an automated process using map, interactive map component, for instance. And I just stumbled upon it. I just tried my way forward with, uh, with the tasks and the requirement that I know they're having in this application. And then all of a sudden I, I found a great solution. I would never have had that solution if I had just sat with the Word document and describing what I wanted to build. Then I would have built the same thing that they have today and no advancement would be made. So just wanted to take too many minutes and too many mispronunciations to tell you to listen to Neil Benson's latest podcast episode of the amazing applications podcast. Yeah. And done. <laughs> well, I mean, this, this is, you know, we have time to discuss this a, a couple minutes, a couple minutes more maybe, but to me, the most successful projects that I've worked on is when there is a very good collaboration between the end users and like myself or the people working on building the solution. I mean, I've been in those projects where you know, we spend hours or days or weeks running up these complex specs and this other system, here's how it's going to address the requirements. And you give that to the users. And of course they have their day jobs. 
for them to read through all this. And what you end up with is you spend all of these hours building a solution. And at the end of the solution, it's like, well, this is not what we need. Or what about this? Or what about that? And then you run into a situation of, um, we didn't know what to ask and you didn't know what to tell us. And this is why this particular feature is missing or this particular functionality is not there because a lot of times there are those, what I call unconscious processes. And back in the older days of software development, yeah, it was a lot harder to build out these things. But the great thing with Power Apps, whether it be any of the, the five pillars of the Power Platform, it's not hard to sit down saying, hey, we want to have an application to um, you know, manage, manage a schedule. Well, we can sit down and a couple hours later have something kind of halfway working in a Canvas app or even in you know, a model-driven app if it's more model or more data-driven or you know, even a page up on a website or you know, all of these things. And then you can show that to the customers. And even if they have, you know, and they can say, oh, that's exactly what I want, although it's missing this. And it's, or it's, you know, would it be great if it could do this? And then this iterative approach, I would be willing to bet that you probably end up saving time and frustration with your customers with this um, whole experimental approach to building applications. Um, and I still think there, you know, there has to be a little bit of pre-planning ahead of time and, you know, almost having at least of a vision, a paragraph. We want a system, and this is where user stories come in great. It's like, we need a system to do this. And then at least now we have the tools we can actually build and address that user story very quickly and show it off and get the feedback. So yeah, definitely, um, you know, th this is, as they say in the Mandalorian, this is the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel that as well. And I think this is where fusion teams come in and the maker is very important. So having a maker that is in the business, in the process, know where it hurts, know what they want, being able to go into the platform and actually try this out and say what they can see, how far they can get and have time to play and to see. I think that is very valuable as well. And I know to the point that you were making, I showed one of those. Um, so the week that I discovered the interactive map component could be something for us. I showed it to the woman that is doing the manual work today and immediately her head went to, oh, if I push that pen, then there's a card and then I can swap, uh, swap the controller and then I can, oh, oh, if I can do this or if I can do that. And her head ex straight away went to the, oh my God, this is great. Um, and she had so many additional requirements that we would never have if I were to write that document that you were talking about and to have her read through it. She wouldn't have you know, the, the, the background to, to understand even what I was, and we would probably speak to different languages. I would be too technical. She would not understand. And it would be that kind of that barrier as well. Being able to just see something on the screen and click and see what it does. So that is very powerful. And you know where this is all going. The, the next step with co-pilots is where someone like ourselves who are very well versed in the power platform and how these things are linked together. Cause I still believe you need that knowledge and that experience, but then, you know, the co-pilot can be sort of three people sitting there. Well, three people, sorry, three entities, two people and the co-pilot where you're showing off what you've built. And then the person can say, yeah, but wouldn't it be great if it could do this? Well, then with the co-pilot, you could say, Hey, add a, add a button or add a table to the, to the application. And Copilot will go off and it will do its thing. And then you work together and you continue to build that app. So this is, yeah, the future for building applications is just, it's just going to accelerate with, you know, these, not only these tools, but these new method methodologies, and it's going to be a new way to learn how to work and become, you know, still as professionals, they'll still need us but still with that collaboration with the end users and then also using these new tools to make that rapidly available to save, to save the time. Because at the end of the day, these end users still have their day jobs. So this will help them, you know, visualize and build the tools to help them do their, their day jobs. And then also empower those people who are makers to build their own apps as well, that have a little bit of that technical ability to kind of continue on with this as well. So at the end of the day, I think, there's still going to be plenty of work for everybody, um, but we're just going to be able to do do more with less. Ooh, you got it right. I'm so proud of you. 
I always get it the backwards. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. So that is actually a segue over to the events section of this podcast. Because that the first time I heard that was on a Microsoft event, actually. Um, we have two very special events that we wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, European Power Platform Conference is coming up on uh, in June. So the European Power Platform Conference is taking place in Dublin, Ireland, June 20th to 22nd. There are going to be over 90, 90 incredible sessions. That's a lot to jam in two days. Well, three days. But um, And I actually have two sessions. Um, so hopefully if you're going out of those 90, hopefully you'll pick mine if you'd like. Um, and there's two keynotes as well. And uh, check out the program online. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes, of course. And if you book book before May 12th, so you still have a week or so to, you know, just check with your boss and say, I need to go to this conference because there's 90 sessions. There's a lot of cool stuff. And, and also tell your boss you can get 10% off using the boost, B-O-O-S-T. Use that code and you get 10% off registration for the European Power Platform Conference. And the other thing I wanted to mention is we both, Ulrike and I, were going to be there. And we, we did discuss this ahead of time, right? So we're going to do <laughs> daily updates um, from each day of the of the, the conference and be publishing those. So um, if you if you are there and you after the day of the conference, you kind of want to hear what what else is going on? We'll try to do a quick little summary on that. And if you decide, if you can't go, then at least this is another way that you can kind of keep on top of what's happening. So looking forward to doing that. You know what that means, right? That we have to go to different sessions all day and we have to cover the whole Power Platform. We cannot just go to the Power Pages things that we want to, right? You, you do get that. <laughs> oh, I have to go to mine though. Oh, didn't think about that. <laughs> And if you want to be our special, you know, if you want to, if you're very into Power BI and you want to go to all the Power BI sessions and tell us about what you learned, then go for it. Tell us in advance and we'll make it happen. Awesome. Perfect. We're up for delegating, of course. And then Microsoft Power Platform Conference in Vegas in October, we have a promo code that get you 10% off your ticket. There you are. Perfect. Um, just use the code BOOST as well, same as for a European one, B-O-O-S-T, and you get 10 percent off, off your ticket. Um, and as um, uh, if that wasn't enough, we would also like to ask you to buy us a coffee or buy us a beer. We have <laughs> had this up and running for a while. We need to mention that as well. Yep. Uh, so if you want to buy a severe or a coffee, go to buymeacoffee.com dash powerplatboost. Um, it would be very appreciable, uh, very nice if you could do that for us um, and support us in this podcast. And also to close things off, I wanted to mention, because I have a crazy week ahead of me. Um, so if you're uh, in Norway, then tomorrow tomorrow evening, we're doing an AI at the pub event before the big AI plus conference in Halden, where that's my home time. That's where I'm from. Uh, it's 90 minutes with AI all over the place. It's a really, really cool event at a local pub. Really looking forward to that. I'm going to show off the product platform AM co-pilot capabilities. It's going to be really cool. And then, Nick, you're joining me on the portal launch on May 10th. Together with Franco Musa and Gaut de Kambik. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Looking We're forward to that. People. Yep. Exactly. And yeah. I, I get to do that in English, right? Uh, no. Didn't I tell you? <laughs> it's in Norwegian. All righty. Okay. No, just kidding. You're in Duolingo, right? You can do it. Yep. I believe in you. <laughs> no, it's going to be a really special episode. So a Portal Lunch is something that we have in Norway. It's a, a community event, a meetup that we do every quarter. It's in Norwegian. It's not recorded. So that's why you probably didn't heard of it before. Uh, but on May 10th, we're doing a special episode. It will be in English. It will be recorded. It will be um, Nick telling us uh, about what use cases Power Pages is for, how to use, um, how to get started with Power Pages. Uh, Frank Gaute uh, Kramvik will show us and tell us about his experience when he got started with Power Pages. Um, and Franco Musso will demo 
a live my page that we're working on with a Norwegian customer uh, and show the what you can do because that is a portal that is really, really cool using out of the box functionality, but also extended a lot. So Franco's done so many cool things. So there, shout out to Franco as well. We need to get it in there. Awesome. And then uh, in the end of May, I'm doing a four hour workshop at the local Dynamics user group here in Oslo. It's gonna be very cool as well. So a lot of things going on, a lot of things to look forward to. And now we're closing up on 50 minutes. That's great, Nick. Trying to keep it under 30. We're, yeah, it's going great every time. Yeah, we're on point. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. So if you're still here, then thank you so much. We really appreciate you wanted to listen to us talk for 50 minutes about Power Platform stuff. I, um, I'm very grateful for you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks for listening to the Power Platform Boost podcast with your hosts, Ulrika Quebec and Nick Dolman. Follow us on social platforms, except TikTok, uh, and email us at hello at powerplatformboost.com. And please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time for your timely boost of Power Platform news. Bye, everybody.